Good morning, folks. Good to see you today, and uh, I've got a, I, I promised this to you last week, uh, and we've uh, got things loaded up this week, but uh, as most of you know, uh, Sandy and I took a trip to South Korea uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, we are finally getting back on schedule with our sleep schedule. They're about 12 hours uh, ahead of us, and so right now, it's uh, about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night over there. Uh, and two, one thing I didn't tell you last week about Korea is the fact that we had to have a, a, a COVID test before we got on the plane and went to South Korea, right? But while we were there, in the 10 days that we were there, nine days that we were there, we had three more tests. Unbelievable, right? Two tests while we were there in Korea, and then another test just aboard the plane to come back to the United States. And I tell you what, I am over having all of those COVID tests right now. But at any rate, it is good to be back home. And uh, like I promised last week, I've got some pictures for you today. And I think we have pictures uh, of our little granddaughter. Uh, let's bring, go ahead and bring those up, shall we, Nicole? Uh, we've got the first one. Can you bring, there we go. Yeah, that's little Millie Beth at a local park. She's got a little scooter. She just loves riding that little thing. And uh, right behind, well, let's go to the last one. Right behind her, uh, there's this sidewalk made up of nothing but rocks. And you're supposed to it's really, really long, types of rocks, really, really long. And it, um, and, and, and it hurts my feet. I tried it. I just couldn't do it. But at any rate, let's go to the next one. And this is uh, Sandy and myself and, and Millie Beth. And uh, that's basically a botanical garden where we uh, spent the day one time. It's just a really beautiful place. We've got another one here, and uh, let's bring that next one up, shall we? There we go. That's at a local... Uh, in, that's just the sweetest little picture of that little girl, I tell you what. And the next one that we've got for you just shows you what a little ham bone she is. Let's bring that one up. Look at that smile. You've got to fall in love with that smile, right? That's our son Caleb, his wife Catherine, and uh, Caleb is a chemistry teacher uh, in the school over there. And, and, and let me say this, Condi was talking about uh, uh, Geronimo, Geronimo Amen, uh, a school uh, a model that uh, we are subscribing to. And uh, Christian, uh, Caleb teaches in a Christian school. It's one of the smaller Christian schools over in South Korea. Uh, they have about 1,000 students total in their high school and their elementary, and there are other schools over there that uh, have a lot more students than that. Christian schools, in, especially in Seoul, are a big thing, and uh, so we're glad that we're able to uh, hopefully meet that need in our community as well. Now, today we find ourselves in the book of Ephesians once again. We're in chapter 5, and so drag out your Bibles, would you please, chapter 5. We're going to be looking this morning specifically at verses 21, 22, 23, and 24. Now, the text that we're going to look at today and the texts that we're going to be looking at in the next several weeks are challenging texts, just let me tell you that. And they're challenging not because of the syntax. They're challenging not because of the sentence structure. They're challenging not because of the verbs that are used in the text. But they're challenging because of the world in which we live. You see, Paul's words in these verses that we're going to be looking at today and in the next couple of weeks, the words that Paul uses are not politically correct. And to tell you the truth, our verses for, the, for, for today and the next several weeks, they're like a minefield to go through. You see, we're going to be talking today and the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about authority, we're going to be talking about submission, but we're also going to be talking about self-sacrifice. And so let's dive right on in this morning by looking at our text for today, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. If you have a Bible app open, please open that Bible app to Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. There the Apostle Paul says in verse 21, submit to one another. And, and, and notice this. He says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he goes on to say, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. And then he doesn't stop there. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. 
Now, one thing I like to do when preparing for sermons is to look at the same text in other translations or other paraphrases. And one of the paraphrases that I really, really like is the Message Paraphrase Bible. Let's bring that one up, shall we? The Message Paraphrase Bible. This is how the message puts it. Out of respect for Christ, be courteously reverent to one another. Wives, understand and support your husbands in the ways that show your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to his church. Not by domineering, but by cherishing. Did you catch that? Not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ as he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. Now when you look at the book of Ephesians, in chapters 1, 2, and 3, those first three chapters in the book of Ephesians deal with theology. The second half of the book of Ephesians deals with our conduct. It's all about our conduct as followers of Jesus Christ. Our conduct with non-believers, our conduct with fellow believers, and also our conduct with with those people in our own family. Now today and for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about the home and the family. And here's a point that I really want you to keep in the forefront of your mind. Of all the relationships that Paul is talking about, you see, all of these relationships hinge on the very same concept. And that concept is this. It's submission. Husbands and wives employers, employees. And Paul talks about those relationships and they hinge on what he actually says in verse 21. Now I know we've already looked at verse 21, but we're going to look at verse 21 several times this morning. And let me remind you what verse 21 says. There the apostle Paul says, submit, submit to whom, church? Submit to? Submit to one another. It's a mutual submission thing, one to another. Uh, and, and what's our motivation? Out of reverence for Christ. You see, the concept of, uh, of, of submission is the underpinning of all of these relationships all the way through chapter 6, verse 9. And let me say this about submission. This section of Scripture that we're going to be looking at today and in the next several weeks, these scriptures, I think, teach balance when it comes to leadership and submission. They teach balance when it comes to leadership. And let me say this as well. Domination is never, ever spirit-filled leadership. Did you get that? Domination is never, ever spirit-filled leadership. And here's an interesting thing for you to do when you go to work tomorrow, an interesting exercise for you to engage in. Now, a cup of coffee with your fellow employees, men and women alike. What I want you to do is this. As you're enjoying coffee with I want you to say something like, you know what our pastor talked about yesterday? He talked about wives being in submission to their husbands. Can you do that for me? I dare you to do that tomorrow. And some of you are kind of nervously giggling, aren't you? And do you know why you're giggling? You're giggling because you know what you're going to get. You know what you're going to hear. What are you talking about? Your pastor said something like that? Is he some crazy lunatic? I mean, is he a fanatic? Is he, is, is he out of his gourd? I mean, what's going on? No, I'm not a lunatic. I'm not out of my gourd. At least that's not what my wife has said to me yet today, right? All I'm doing is talking about what the Bible says. There we go. Do we have? <laughs> Let's hope we didn't have another, another uh, lightning strike, right? Wow. At any rate, let's go on, shall we? What I want you to do, 
in talking with one another, what I want you to do, in maybe talking with some people at work, okay, if you do, what I want you to do in life in general is this. I want you to think biblically. Do not think culturally. We're trying to get things going again. What I want you to do is to think biblically. Don't think culturally. I think that's in your out. Think biblically, not culturally. You see, what I want you to do is this. I want you to be able to allow Scripture to tell you where you stand. Allow Scripture to tell you where you stand. Do not allow the culture in which we live to tell you where you stand when it comes on biblical concepts. See life, see this world from the vantage point of God rather than the vantage point of mankind. And when you do that, I'm just warning you here, when you do that, you're going to get some pushback. In fact, you might get some big time pushback people, but don't be surprised about that because Jesus warned us about it. Jesus said in John chapter 15, he says, hey, listen, if you live the kind of lifestyle that, 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 that I'm promoting, if you live the kind of lifestyle that I want you to live as your Lord and your Savior, there will be people who will hate you because of it. But guess what? Being a Jesus follower is not a popularity contest. There will be people, in fact, there probably are people who don't like you because you're a Jesus follower. There may even be people who hate you because you live Jesus' way. And so think biblically, don't think culturally. And with this in mind, what I want us to do is look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, the verse that all of these relationships hinge on, all righty? I'm not sure if we have, there we go, good job, thanks a lot, guys. We've got a lot of people scrambling right now behind the scenes to get everything going again. Let's look at this hinge verse, shall we? Verse 21, chapter 5. Submit, what's it say there, church? Submit to? Submit to one another. Why should we do that? Out of reverence for Christ. That's why. Now, the word submit there in that verse means to arrange according to rank. Arrange according to rank. Let's think in terms of the military. In our chapel service, we had a lot of uh, former military uh, people. How about in this church service? Do we have any military folks in our church service right now? Yeah, we have a fair, a fair amount of military people. Good to, good to see that. Um, let's think in the terms of the military. My, my dad, when he was in the military, he was a corporal. Corporal answers to a sergeant. A lieutenant is in a subservient role to a captain. A captain is in a subservient role to a colonel. You see, those are roles there that I'm talking about. Roles that we're talking about. And so out of respect for the rank, I salute. Out of respect for the role, I submit. And the Apostle Paul here in verse 21 is talking about wives and husbands. And he says, submit, and do you remember what the rest of the verse said? Submit to one another. Submit to one another. You see, the Apostle Paul, back up in verse 18, chapter 5, talked about the Spirit-filled Christian. And the Spirit-filled Christian is a submissive kind of person. That means in the family of God, that means in the church, we're not in competition with one another. That, 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 that means that we're not going get, to uh, get, get, get in each other's way. We don't pull rank on other people. And, and, and let me say this. Men never, ever dominate over women. That's uncalled for. Kids, on the other hand, guess what? They're respectful of their parents as well. You see, we are not overbearing parents who are unfair to our kids. Employees are submissive. Employers are respectful. And so it trickles all the way down through all of these relationships. You see, the Spirit-filled believer is a submissive follower of Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus, in the flesh, submitted to the cross. Do you remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 3? 
There he says, don't think of yourself, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Don't get a big head about yourself. You see, regardless of gender, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, we model the life of Jesus Christ. And when we model the life of Jesus Christ, three things develop. We've got dignity. We've also got equality. We've also got unity. That's what we have. You see, in God's eyes, hear me on this, in God's eyes, there is no man, no woman, no child, no parent in terms of worth. We are all equal. We are all equal with one another as far as our worth goes. However, when it comes to roles, there are differentiations. But as individuals, there's dignity, there's equality, there's, there's unity. And what I want you to do, folks, is to think biblically here. Do not think culturally. Our culture is way off in the weeds right now. And what we need to do is to think biblically, biblically. My wife Sandy, who isn't able to be here today, she is as worthy as I am. She is as worthy as I am. She and I are absolute equals with eternal spirits. She is worth dignity. She is worth respect just as much as I am worth dignity and respect. Now, before we go on to verse 22, let me say this. You need to know, when it comes to submission, submission is Christ-like. Okay? Submission is Christ-like. Let's look at verse 22, shall we? Verse 22, the Apostle Paul says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Now, now, now that word submit. That word submit there has nothing to do with wives being inferior to husbands. It has nothing to do with wives being inferior to husbands. Do you remember what I said just a second ago? My wife is just as worthy of respect as I am. We're equals in, God, we're equals in God's eyes. You see, this word submit in the text here, it has nothing to do with a woman being inferior to a man. It has everything to do with dignity and unity and equality. You see, in God's plan, when He was putting the plan together for this world, and I don't know why He did this. I don't know why. But He arranged for certain roles to be in authority over, over other roles. I don't know why, but that's what He did. Now, that does not mean one person is better than another person. But remember this. If roles are not followed, there will be confusion in the home. If roles are not followed, there will be rebellion and unhappiness and a breakdown in God's order. And, 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 I've, and I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. I think this is one of your bullet points. Equality of worth has nothing to do with identity of roles. Equality of worth has nothing to do with identity of roles. Nothing. Ladies, you are just as worthy as your husbands, but God, in His infinite wisdom, has placed the husband in the lead role. And husbands, you're just as worthy as your wives, but you're, and hear me on this loud and clear, but your authority does not give you a green light to rule in your home as a tyrant. It just does not. I have dealt with a few of those cases through the years, and they have always said, you know what, the Bible says I'm the head of the home. But being the head of the home does not give you a green light to be a tyrant in the home. It just does not. If you are abusive toward your wife, fellas, that is flat out wrong. I'll go as far to say that is flat out sinful. Don't abuse in any way, shape, or form. If you fellows are unfair in your leadership, it's not right. Fellows, you expect something of your kids that God does not expect? 
that's wrong. There's a commentator, several of, you know who, several of you will know who this guy is, John Stott, I've quoted him before, talked about him before. In his book, on the book, I want to paragraphs that he wrote, and, and he basically says this. He basically says that the authority of the husband, the parent, the employer, their authority is not unlimited, or that wives and children and employees are required to give unconditional obedience. If husbands misuse their God-given authority by commanding what God forbids or by forbidding what God commands, then that other person needs to follow God's lead rather than that boss's, rather than that parent's, rather than that husband's lead if they tell them to do something that goes against what God wants them to do. And, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again this morning, a husband's authority, a husband's authority is not a green light to be a tyrant. The husband's authority is not a green light to be a tyrant. God's authority always, it always trumps man's authority. This is what Peter said. This is what Peter said in Acts 5.29. Peter said this, we must obey who? We must obey God rather than man. Obey God. Now, the key to verse 22, I think, is found in the end of verse 22. The key is this, as to the Lord. That's what he says. As to the Lord. This has everything to do in my mind with attitude. A wife's submission is something that she does out of respect for Christ, out of respect for the Lord, out of respect for Jesus. Now, <clears throat> I've been a pastor for quite a few years. I, I'm 35, 40 years or so. And because I am a pastor, I believe that God wants me to do certain things. And as a pastor, I think God wants me to think in certain ways. And to be very honest with you, some of those things that I do and some of those things that I think, the ways that I think, actually go against my nature. I don't, they go against my nature. However, out of respect for God, out of respect for the Lord, I go ahead and do those things anyway. I go ahead and think that way anyway, out of respect for the Lord. You see, all of us ought to live how God wants us to live and think how God wants us to think out of respect for Him. Not out of respect for our government. Not out of respect for the media. Not out of respect for the social media. Out of respect for God. Look at verse 23 with me, would you? For the husband, he says, is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Jesus gives loving and truthful leadership in the church. As husbands, we need to give loving and truthful leadership in our homes. There are days, and there have been days, and there will probably continue to be days in my life where I think to myself, you know what, I just wish that these roles were reversed. Because understand, in my estimation, leading how God wants me to lead is more difficult than following how God wants me to follow. Some days I just want to be a follower rather than a leader. Question for you of your head on your shoulders? What is the function of the head on your shoulders? The head on your shoulders gives you direction, right? When the body doesn't follow what the head says to do, there is dysfunction, there is paralysis, there may even be disease. And we sympathize with people who have paralysis. We sympathize with people sometimes who have dysfunction. We sympathize with people who have diseases, right? When you see the head of a home who is leading the way that God wants them to lead and the wife isn't following, what you're watching 
is dysfunction in action. Now let me follow that statement up with, from my observation over 35, 40 years, from my observation, I would say that more often than not, not always, but more often than not, it's the husband who is at fault in the dysfunction and not the wife. Tomorrow I have my third wedding in three weeks. I've really enjoyed doing those other two weddings. I really have. It's been a lot of fun. Tomorrow I'm most excited about the wedding I'm going to be doing in the afternoon. Why am I most excited about that wedding tomorrow afternoon? I'm most excited about that wedding tomorrow afternoon because it's a reunification of a husband and wife. They've been having problems for a couple of years now. A couple of years now, those problems finally came to a head, and they got divorced this summer. We've been talking since the spring, and God, they have seen what God wants them to see, and they're going to be remarried tomorrow. And I would say, in the, and, and, and they would agree, in this situation, it was the husband who was in the, ma- in the majority of the dysfunction. And he suddenly woke up and realized what was going on and gotten close back with God. And the two of them now are not only reuniting, reuniting with one another, but they're reuniting with God as well. All of the relationships that we're talking about in these verses this week and the next couple of weeks hinge on that one verse. Verse 21, chapter 5. Let's look at it another time. There, let's, let's read this out loud together, shall we? Let's read it out loud together. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Mutual submission out of respect for Jesus. And then Paul goes on and writes these words in verse 24. He says this, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands. This is serious stuff that the Apostle Paul is talking about. And what Paul is talking about goes against my nature, and I would venture to say goes against your nature as well. I think all of us, mostly myself, but I think all of us, are by nature to our, in our core, I think we're selfish kind of people. I want my way. If I don't get my way, it's the highway. If you don't fulfill that contract the way it is written up, if you don't do this, if you don't do that, if you don't do the other thing, guess what? I'm going to sue you. We are selfish at the core. We want our way or it's the highway. And you show me a man who leads the home as God would have him lead the home. I will show you a woman who is madly in love with that man. They honor one another. They respect one another. They enjoy one another. They delight in one another. Now, having said that, do couples like this have their arguments? <laughs> yes, they do. Do couples like this get crossways with each other? The obvious answer is yes, they do. They get crossways with each other. I mean, we're imperfect people, right? Here's the deal, though you never ever develop a plan to walk out. You're always trying to develop a plan to work things out. Now, as we kind of close things down today, let's, let's kind of review. Equality doesn't mean, equality does not mean identity of roles. It doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean identity of roles. You see, no one is worth more than another in God's eyes. But the role God has laid out for each of us in our families, the roles that God has laid out for us are to be filled correctly and followed correctly. There's to be dialogue between husbands and wives. There's to be give and take between husbands and wives. There's to be compromise between husbands and wives. 
an exchange of ideas between husbands and wives. And the thing of it is, if you can't work that out, then get some help. We've got access here in Kokomo as well as the north side of Indianapolis. We've got access to some wonderful counselors. We really do. This couple that I'm tomorrow, they're going through counseling. They've gotten to the point now where they're going, you know what? We realized what was wrong, and we're wanting to put it back together. So you go. You listen. You submit. You don't fight it. You bring the heartbreak. You bring the scars. You bring the the fights that you've had. And you will be absolutely amazed as to what God can do to restore the relationship. But here's a key in restoring relationships. It takes both the husband and the wife who are motivated to restore the relationship. I've talked with couples over the years where one really wanted to restore and the other was like, I can't believe what she did. I can't believe how he did that. You've got to have both people who are wanting to restore the relationship. You see, here's a problem in our culture. We are told that there's greener grass on the other side of the fence, right? I've dealt with this too. Well, you know what? We've been fighting for a couple of years now, and he just won't listen. She just won't understand. And he and she and he and she. And you know what? I am tired of it all. I'm up to here with it all, and I am cutting my losses, and I am going over to the other side of the fence. And you know what? I'm hoping to find someone who appreciates me. I'm hoping to find somebody who will love me. I'm hoping to f- uh, find somebody who will who really honor me and, 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 and keep me. I want to find somebody on the other side of the fence who appreciates me. I'm here to tell you today, I have seen it in I don't know how many instances where people have jumped the fence to the other side and they have found out the grass is not greener on that other side of the fence. And here's something else. You're in your relationship. You got things you need to work out. You decide rather, though, to break up. Let me say this, if you don't fix you in the current relationship, the next relationship that you make with a significant other, you will carry those old problems of you from this relationship to the next relationship. And if you get you fixed in the present relationship, why not stay together? I'm here to tell you today it's a whole lot cheaper. Heartache. Fix you and honor God. Next, a husband's authority. I've said it a couple of three times before. A husband's authority is not a green light to be a tyrant. To be the head of the family in no way gives you a license to take unfair advantage of those who are living in the home. I mean, did Jesus ever command... Anything that we look back and we say, you know what, that was unfair. That just was not right. I've not found anything like that. I just haven't. If a husband pushes his wife to disobey God, she should follow God. Period. You see, we should never disobey God in order to follow the lead of any other human being, let alone be a husband. We should always follow God's lead. Headship is not dictatorship. Leadership like Jesus starts from the vantage point of love. Leadership like Jesus starts from the vantage point of nurturing and love, building up, encouraging, I had the opportunity for a number of years. We had uh, one of our friends at the time was the second person in charge of the convention center in the Hoosier Dome. And so we would get comp tickets to a lot of different things. And with us being, you know, church people, uh, we got comp tickets to the 
Gaither Praise Gathering every year. And so we went to the Gaither Praise Gathering for a number of years. And one of the speakers who was at the Gaither Praise Gathering for quite a few years was a commentator, Christian writer by the name of Stuart Briscoe. I'm not even sure if Stuart Briscoe is still alive, but uh, at the time he was preaching up in, I believe, Madison, Wisconsin. And not to take anything away from Stuart Briscoe, but his wife, uh, Jill, she was a great writer in her, in her own right. And, and, and one of the things I remember from, um, from the pra praise gathering a couple of years, she said this. She says, a man of equality is never threatened by a woman of equality. I thought that was good. A man of equality is never threatened by a woman of, a, of equality. It takes a secure man with a humble, sub submissive spirit to lead as Jesus wants him to lead. Let me say that again, fellas. It takes a secure man with a humble, submissive spirit to lead as Jesus wants him to lead. And ladies, it takes a godly, humble wife to follow as Jesus wants her to follow. Now, we all know, don't we, we live in an imperfect world. We, as Jesus' followers, are walking through a minefield in our culture. Our culture, as Condi talked about, our culture is diametrically opposed to the things of God. Now, while we live in an imperfect world, we are an imperfect people. We are an imperfect people living in an imperfect world. I mean, all of us mess up. All of us fall short, don't we? We fall short of living and loving the way God wants us to live and love. And wives are to love Jesus enough, out of respect, to submit. And let me follow that up by saying this, fellas. As guys, we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Fellas, are you on board with me? And that begs the question, how much did Jesus love the church? Jesus loved the church, His bride, so much so that He died for her. That He died for her. And so push comes to shove, fellas. Someone's got a gun. Which one is it? Fellas, we go, take me. Let her live. And that's what Jesus did for you. Jesus said, take me. Let my bride live. And praise God, you and me, we're his bride. And the bride is flourishing. Let's bow our heads and pray, shall we? Our Father in heaven, we are truly thankful for the words that you gave us through the Apostle Paul. God, living a life like this that you want us to live is not easy. I mean, goodness. We're, we're, we're human beings. We are so imperfect. So imperfect. We get things in our head and we just won't let go of them. And so, God, I pray today that um, your words would not fall on deaf ears. That, God, your words from Paul would settle in our spirits and we would mull them over and mull them over and use them in our lives. And God, if there's any here, anyone here today who doesn't understand the amount of love that you have for us, that Jesus had for his bride, the church, God, I pray that we'll be, that we'll be able to begin to comprehend that, that Jesus loved his bride, the church, so much, he was willing to die for her on an ugly, cruel, death instrument called the cross and God we can have a relationship with you through him and God I pray that if there are people here that they would want to either renew their relationship with you through Jesus or start that relationship today God now bless us as we each make decisions that we need to make we pray in Jesus name amen As we prepare, prepare for communion, some of, some of you may have seen this on my post, Facebook post earlier this week. In the period of the judges, 
Lots was happening in their culture, in their society, in their politics, and most of it was bad. Every person did what was right in their own eyes. Literally translated, well, whatever seemed right to them, that's what they were gonna do for themselves. It was complete moral relativism. Kind of one of the themes we've been talking about today. It's kind of interesting, I think. Sounds like our culture, our country in many ways. And in fact, if you listen closely to what was going on, if you read the book of Judges and look at our culture, we really can't tell much difference. We treat each other the same way. We're brutal, we're murderous, we're contemptuous people apart from Christ. Our culture and even some in the church, they like Jesus' words when the words tickle their ears or fits what they view Jesus to be. But what Jesus tells us is it's all about what he said and did, every bit of it. All the words in the Bible are about him. So we can't just cut and paste parts of it that we like and don't like and edit it out. Which is why here in the letter of Ephesians, it's showing us that God expects us to live in a certain way. Remember back when we looked at the first part of chapter 5, verse 5. Those who live like the world, they have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. That's what Paul said. We're not to even partner with them. As we continue reading in the chapter, in chapter 5, we come to today's passage, which Lynn talked about, that each one of us is to submit to one another. It's a mutual submission. It's the way the Father was submitted to the Son. The main theme of Ephesians that Paul's been driving at, that he's now getting into the nitty-gritty, is that it's all about the unity. Do we show the world a different reality? Are we united? Because so many things in our world are divided. Ethnic groups are divided. Husbands and wives can be divided. Families, parents, and kids can be divided. Bosses and employees, they can be divided. That's why Paul said, now as the church submits to Christ, as we mutually submit to each other and submit to who Jesus is and what he's done for us, we show the world who we are, who he is. That's why back in verse 18, he says, be filled with the Spirit, because you can't do it on your own. The only way you can live this life is letting God live in you and through you. And that's what we celebrate when we get to communion. We participate with Jesus. We participate in what he's doing in us, in our hearts, in our minds. We participate in what is he's doing in this world. And we love each other as Christ loved his bride. That's why it says in verse 30 that we're members of his body. If we live without unity, we're no different than the world. We need to show the world through communion, union, you see the the community coming together in unity, that's what it's talking about. We're united in Christ. We submit to each other, we submit to God. We live in God's kingdom and his reality. We're part of a new family. And that's what we do when we take communion. We remind ourselves that we're united to Christ for what Christ did to us, we are his bride. There's a relationship there. So we participate. It's not just an act of taking some bread and some juice. It's a participation. And if you really read through scripture, our salvation is participation in the reality of who Jesus is and what he's doing. That's what it means to be saved. So part of our communion is reminding ourselves of that participation. So as you take the bread and as you take the juice today, remember it's not just about you. It's about us. It's about him and how we work together. Let's pray. Gracious Father God, it's amazing that you entered time and space, that you sent your son to redeem, to restore, to reconcile all of us back to each other and back to you. That you've given us your spirit to guide us and lead us and that we are part of this new family. Lord, as we take communion, 
may it be a reaffirmation of our pledge, of our vows to you and to each other. And it's through the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen.